In this interview we recorded at COP29, Professor Hugh Hunt speaks with UK Climate Change Committee Chair Piers Forster. Piers clearly asserts that carbon capture and storage technologies, CCS, that are forecast to remove emissions from so-called hard-to-abate sectors like aviation and steel, will not be enough to offset the damage causing carbon pollution. Whether CCS is viable at any meaningful scale remains highly uncertain. At a time when global heating is accelerating and the destructive impacts such as fires and floods are making much of the planet uninsurable, phasing out fossil fuels and reducing carbon pollution has never been a more serious issue. Forster also responds to questions relating to Al Gore calling CCS a fraud and whether the UK is anywhere near prepared for the more extreme climate impacts that are coming towards us. The UK must take phasing out of fossil fuels and protecting nature seriously to send a signal that we are truly out of the extractive and destructive 20th century mindset that has become an existential threat. Thank you for listening. I'm Hugh Hunt and I'm here with Piers Forster, who's the chair of the Climate Change Committee in the UK. We hear that the UK is a shining example uh, set. The ambition for 2035 is, is what, 81% yeah, that's down right. on fossil fuels? Uh, is that? Yeah, that's, that is right. So, so the government had just signed up to the 81 percent reduction commitment on 1990 by 2035 and that was based on our committee's advice we gave to the Secretary of State back in October and it really does represent a really committed benchmark that sets on a par not in front of other countries but really up there with some of the most progressive countries like the EU and I think with both the UK and kind of Brazil turning up with ambitious NDCs, I think it does at least kind of push other countries and it shows them the, in the direction anyway. And how do we deal with um, with monitoring? And Because uh, we've got to get everybody behind us and to, to trust that what we're doing is actually happening. Yeah, um, so we did a lot of work when we set our advice to try and indicate that this NDC wasn't just an ambitious target, that it would actually be deliverable. So NDC is? is the national need determined contribution to the way you aggregate the different contributions from each country. So each country does make a commitment, but you have to make sure those commitments really come with credible stuff behind them. So to do that, we gave independent expert advice to really show that the 81% is not only our ambitious target, but, but we can actually deliver to it as a country in a kind of way that is good for the jobs and, and the economy. How much uh, carbon capture and storage is, uh, is tied up in, in this ambition? We are going to publish our complete analysis on that for our CB7 advice next February. That's the seventh carbon budget. For that, we're going to come up with a brand new trajectory for all the economy, and that does include the role of removals. But if you go back to our old advice, there was certainly a significant part of a certain amount of removals, and that to do various things. The first is to support the net zero in the difficult to decarbonize industry, and the other thing is to offset the hard to abate sectors, particularly aviation, will be really kind of challenging. So, so, so you have to have a certain amount of removals to compensate for those residual emissions in the economy. But I would say we're absolutely sure as a committee that you can't get there all the way with carbon capital and storage. You have to really address your emissions as much as possible. There can only be a relatively small, relatively kind of small amount of removals. And uh, the Prime Minister was earmarking 22 billion for uh, carbon capture and storage? Yeah, well, we're absolutely supportive of that investment by the government. And you would both look at the details of that, and that is 22 billion over a 25 year time period, particularly to support two industrial clusters. And that is an important part of this work, just because we have to think about the just transiting components of that net zero trajectory. And this is, we have to look at our industry in the UK to a certain extent, and we can't get net zero just by completely shutting down our industries. 
For example, if you look at Port Talbot, if you look at Graves Mouth, we have to be careful about supporting our industries. And, and that is where the 22 billion is targeted. Uh, uh, and it's not a commitment to spend 22 billion. It's a commitment that if you don't get the private investment coming there, the government will underwrite it. So it's not a 22 million in the taxpayer cash, it's 22 billion underwriting. And then just here last week, Al Gore said that um, he thought carbon capture and storage was a fraud. What do you make of that? Well, it, it depends on the context. So, so it has been used in argument for continuing expansion of your fossil industry. But and in that case, you oughtn't to do it, you know. Right. So, so we only have a relatively small capacity for carbon dioxide removal. There's only a certain capability. We can only do a certain amount in a sustainable way. And it's also an expensive thing to do. So it does have to be reserved for things where there are no other alternative to decarbonizing. So as soon as you say you want to use it for generating electricity, that's not a good use of it at all, because we have far better technologies, such as PV and wind turbines, of course. Absolutely. Now, Piers, you and I met about 14 years ago on the, on the, on the geoengineering circuit. Yeah, yeah. What are your views these days on geoengineering? Yeah, well, I do think it's a technology that is quite different than a lot of the other ones. If it was ever deployed, it would be a, a very short-term thing, and it could potentially reduce temperatures, but it could also cause sort of other things to our climate and society that could be undesirable. But what I would say is, is it can't take away from the need to reduce our emissions in mass as possible and to put resources and expertise into the adaptation of climate change. And what I think we have an obligation to do, as we are both of us are principally kind of scientists, I think it's very important we understand all the technology, whether it's from system reduction, whether it's carbon dioxide removal, or whether it's these esoteric geoengineering options. I think we have an obligation for our society to research them and understand them so we can give the policy makers here at this COP conference the very best advice possible. So John Shepard, the, the, the napkin diagram from perhaps 20 years ago now, yeah. uh, was saying that emissions reduction alone insufficient Emissions reductions plus carbon dioxide removal, also not sufficient. Solar radiation management, the necessary third leg on this three-legged stool. That was a message from 20 years ago. Do you think that might possibly still hold? Uh, I think we have to look at the opportunities for emission reduction and we have to understand what the climate impacts are of going past 1.5 degrees and 1.6, 1.7 degree climate impacts. What I would say about more of the esoteric things, we do not know if it is a viable solution at all. And we have to be concerned about it being seen as necessary. But one of the key things we can do to reduce temperatures in the relatively short term is action on the non co 2 greenhouse gases, such as methane reduction. And there's a huge opportunity with that, the methane pledge, an important opportunity. And I think a lot of countries could do much, much more for their methane and solution like that could potentially re reduce the rate of temperature increase anyway over the next 10 years. In Cambridge, in our Centre for Climate Repair, we're focusing perhaps more and more on the, on the state of the Arctic. Have you got any thoughts of the, the timescales for summer sea ice in the Arctic? No, I don't. I mean, I could think about it and then probably come back with an answer. Of course, the summer sea ice is under threat, of course, and that over a short time, the next decades. The last time I looked at the IPCC report, there was a bit of a difference in the literature. What I would say, we have to understand the impact completely and more generally. I mean, there are other Arctic impacts, such as Canadian wildfires and things we experience. So you have to understand the entire climate system. The is not one kind of panacea kind of solution that can come in and fix a thing. And that is why these negotiations are so important. You have to try and push as hard as possible in, in lots of different directions. And I don't know enough about your different kind of repair options to really kind of comment.
And uh, one, one last uh, a question. The devastating floods we just saw recently in Valencia in Spain. Yeah. And uh, we had some in Colombia too. And I remember the terrible floods we had in the Somerset levels and Cockermouth. And are we prepared in the UK for goodness knows what might come our way? Well, we have a job of a committee to produce the climate change risk assessment. And part of that is trying to look at our preparedness. And we are absolutely not prepared. We should be. We are encouraging the government to really think about climate resilience. Mm. Just as it, it thinks about reducing its emissions, they do have to go together. We have to work hard to develop a resilient UK, of course to protect lives and livelihood in the UK, look after our transport in infrastructure, look after our energy infrastructure, and also people's homes, of course. And the government need to do a lot more in that direction. I don't know how high Leeds is above sea level, but Cambridge is only about 10 metres above sea level. <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous. Anyway, look, Piers, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of uh, COP29. It's very good to talk to you, and I wish you the very best too. If you are concerned about the future, then why not travel with me through every COP conference from COP21 in Paris to COP28 in Dubai by ordering my book, COP Out, How Governments Have Failed the People on Climate. In COP Out, you'll gain insights into what is actually going on in these supposed world-saving conferences and how we have ended up in this dire era of dangerous consequences. You can order COP Out via the link in the notes or on any online bookstore worldwide in paperback or audio version.